Joining me from New York now is Jeffrey Christian, Managing Partner for CPM Group. Jeff, thanks for being back with us. It's always a pleasure being with you guys. So Jeff, we'll be focusing on Chinese gold demand today. Let's start by looking at what we saw in terms of demand from this year's Lunar New Year celebration, which is still underway. I have reports showing physical sales for gold rose 51% in China during the month of December ahead of the new year. What are you seeing in terms of demand? Well, we yeah, we saw pretty strong demand on a wholesale level, both in December and really through most of January. And even into the last week of January, I think there were wholesalers who were waiting to see if prices would pull back a little bit before they bought. They did the prices didn't pull back and they were buying really right up to the holiday. And now we're in the quiet point where we're actually into the holiday and we're waiting to see what the retail consumer demand is at the dealer level. And we really won't know until the end of this week. Uh, over the weekend, we'll see you know, how the dealers found the actual consumer demand, whether it lived up to their expectations or not. So what next, Jeff? What tends to happen once the Lunar New Year celebration wraps? What happens to demand traditionally? Well, it's, it's sometimes demand dips. I mean, clearly the, the, the highest level of demand at the retail level is the two weeks prior to the holiday when people are buying uh, gold items that they will give as gifts. Uh, the demand usually continues through the holidays. At the end of the holidays, you see retail demand come off. Uh, whether or not that's rep, uh, reflected in inventory selling remains to be seen. I mean, one of the things that happened last year was you had disappointing sales during the Lunar New Year. And at the end of the Lunar New Year holiday, you saw uh, dealers dumping their inventories, which really uh, was the beginning of the downward move in gold prices. So is Chinese demand really supporting the gold price right now? If I have to ask you to weight in in percentage terms, how much of a role is it playing? I would say that Chinese demand in 2013 probably represented about 33 to 40 percent of the support for gold prices that we did see last year. And it's probably the same situation right now. You know, it, it's not the end all and be all, but it is the largest market for gold. And it's been the most uh, voracious market for gold. Jeff, let's now focus on the so-called need for China to buy more gold. Many would argue that China has a strong incentive to hedge against the U.S. dollar and to increase their gold reserves. Now, I know you've said in the past that we haven't seen uh, numbers increase here, as noted by the PBOC. But what's your argument here? Well, you know, the, the, the People's Bank of China says, look, gold is too small and illiquid of a market to play a major role as an alternative to the dollar or the euro in monetary reserves. It can play a minor role, and it will. The PBOC uh, individual officials within the PBOC say, but gold may, may well make sense for the China Investment Corp, the sovereign wealth fund of the government, uh, to, to invest in gold, but it doesn't necessarily make sense as a, as a monetary reserve. So I wouldn't be surprised if CIC has, over the last five years, been buying and selling gold at times as an investor. But, uh, you know, the PBOC has made it clear that it doesn't necessarily see gold as the big end all and, and, and cure for its dollar exposure. It remains heavily exposed to the dollar and it, it knows that it has this exposure to the dollar and it uh it's dealing with it the best it can. Gold is a very small uh, sidestep uh, in terms of its dollar exposure. Jeff, I'd like to now pull up a chart from uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, that shows the rise of China's debt level compared to other countries before their respective financial crises. Is this something to be concerned about, Jeff? I don't think it's really a problem. If you look at the debt to GDP ratios, that's an important factor, but it's not the only important ratio to look at. Uh, furthermore, if you break down that ratio of, of, of debt to GDP, what you find is that the Chinese government's uh, portion is relatively low and the Chinese government, the, the official sector's debt to GDP ratio is very low compared to the U European United States or, or Japanese uh, ratios. So, so what you're really looking at is private sector debt. But both on the private sector and on the public sector, there's another ratio to pay attention to, which is debt versus assets. And the Chinese government and Chinese individuals and corporations, unlike a lot of American and European and Japanese entities, 
have a lot of assets too. They're borrowing against their assets, but they have the capacity to pay back on that debt because they have assets on, on the positive side of their balance sheet. Uh, so looking at debt to GDP only gives you a part of the story. And if you look at the debt ratios, say, to assets uh, and to earnings power, you find that it's probably not nearly as scary as some people would like it, uh, investors would think it is. On that note, Jeff, that's all the time we have today. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, we'll see you soon. And thanks for watching this edition of Commodities Confidential. You can email us at newsfeedback at kitco.com or follow this conversation on Twitter at Daniela Camboni. Thanks for watching.